This is our first video for Chapter 7, and we are going to take a look at cosets and their properties. Let's take a look at what a coset is. So if we let G be a group, and we're going to let H be some subset of that group, and we're going to let A represent basically every element of G, so for all A and G, we're going to define AH as all of the elements where we take the elements of G multiplied on the right hand side by the elements of H. So A comes first and that's why it's called a left coset because the original set is on the left. So the original set G is on the left. So let's take a look at our example before we look at number two and number three. Looking at our example, what we're saying is here's G and G is Z9. And if you'll remember, Z9 is actually a group under modular addition. So even though our example or our definition says AH says take A times H, we're actually going to be taking A plus H. So what are the elements A? These are all of the elements A. We're going to take each of those and we're going to multiply them on the right, or in this case, add on the right, all of the elements H. So here's how this is going to look. I'm going to take A plus H. So I'm going to start with zero plus H, which means I'm going to take zero and I'm going to add all of the elements of H. So zero plus zero is zero. 0 plus 3 is 3, and 0 plus 6 is 6. Easy enough, right? And now I'm going to move on to 1. 1 plus H, and note that I'm using capital H, which tells me I'm taking 1 plus all of the elements of H. So again, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 3 is 4, 1 plus 6 is 7. And then I'm going to do the same for 2. So 2 plus the entire subset H would be 2 plus 0, 2 plus 3, 2 plus 6. Now watch what happens here when I take 3. 3 plus H gives me 3 plus 0, 3 plus 3, 3 plus 6, which is 9, which is actually 0 mod 9. And that's the exact same group I have for 0 plus H. And if I do the same thing for 4 plus H, I'm going to get the same elements as 1 plus H, and 5 plus H is the same as 2 plus H, and 6 plus H, and 7 plus H, and 8 plus H. So the question says, what are the cosets? Well, really, there are three cosets. And those cosets are 0 plus H, 1 plus H, and 2 plus H, because all of the others are essentially the same or duplicates. So for two, it says define H A as H times A, or again, H plus A for additive notation, when H is a subgroup of G, and we call that the right coset. So again, right coset would just be do it on the right hand side. Now for addition like this, we can imagine if I asked you for the right cosets instead, I would have H plus zero H plus one and H plus two as my subsets and they would be the same subsets. So we can see that sometimes the left and right cosets will be the same and we'll talk about some of those properties later in this video. The last one define A H A inverse. Um, we're gonna talk more on that later. So I just wanted to introduce to you the fact that we can in fact take all of the elements H multiplied on the left by A and on the right by A inverse, and that will be another um, sort of coset that we'll talk about. Let's take a look now at a right cosets question. So in this one, we're trying to find all of the right cosets of 111 in U30. Now, I do want to point out that I have listed the elements of U30, which typically isn't done for you, but if it's not done for you, it's really beneficial for you to do that. Keep in mind that right coset says take the elements of H times A. 
So I'm multiplying by a on the right side is what that means. So I'm going to start with h1. So again, I'm starting with an element of g. Uh, and keep in mind that this is in fact multiplicative because this is going to be, you know, mod 30 multiplication. So keep in mind which um, operations go with which sets. So H1 says take 1 times 1, which is 1, and take 11 times 1, which is 11. And then H2, I'm sorry, H7, which is the next element, H7 says take 1 times 7, which is 7, and then take 11 times 7, which is 77, which is actually 17 mod 30. Notice so far, these are uh, distinct groups. One has 111, the other has 717. Now let's look at H11. So H11 has 11, uh, I'm sorry, 1 times 11, which is 11 and 11 times 11, which is actually going to be one. Now, notice I switched colors. I did that because I knew what was going to happen. This is actually the same as H1, so it's not distinct, it's not a new one. Let's look at H13. So H13 says take one times 13, which is 13, and take 11 times 13, which ends up being 23 mod 30. So we've got H1, We've got H7 and we've got H13 that are all distinct sets at this point. Let's take a, take a look at H17. I think it's pretty clear what's going to happen. 17 times 1 is going to give us 17. Um, 11 times 17 is going to give us 7 mod 30. So that is not distinct. Now let's look at H19. So again, I'm starting with H, which is 1. 1 times 19 is 19. 11 times 19 is 29. So again, that's a distinct set. And then if I look at H23, I end up with 23 and 13, but that's the same as H13. And if I look at H29, I end up with 29 and 19, which is the same as H19. So all of the right cosets would be 111, 717, 1323, and 1929. And I do want to point out to you that if you look at all of the elements of G of your original group, each of those elements is represented in one of the cosets and only one, which means these cosets are actually going to partition the elements of G. We're going to take a look at some properties of cosets now, and for each of the nine properties that we're going to talk about, we're going to let H be a subgroup, subgroup of G and A and B be elements in G. So we'll start with A is an element of AH, and of course that means this is the left coset. So we're essentially saying that the element itself must be in the coset. Well, hopefully this makes sense because if H is a subgroup, that means E is an element of H. And all of the elements that are in AH have the form AH. So AH for all A in G and for all H in H. So if E is an element of H and A obviously is an element of G, then if I multiply A times E, that's going to give me A and A is therefore an element of AH. Second property, AH equals H if and only if A is an element of H. So let's take a look at our first example where H was 0, 3, 6. Now we looked at the left cosets and said 
let's take 0 plus h. Well, 0 plus h gave me 0 plus 0, 0 plus 3, 0 plus 6. And then we said if we took 3 plus h, we'd get the exact same thing. And if we took 6 plus h, we'd get the exact same thing. And that's all this is saying, that because a or 0 or 3 or 6 were elements of the subgroup h, that those are all going to be the same as the left coset. And the last one is really just talking about associativity. And this just carries through from the associativity that we already know with subgroups. Let's look at a few more properties. So property four says AH is equal to BH if and only if A is in BH. So again, it, this makes more sense when we're looking at an example. So let's th think about H13 that we looked at on our right cosets question. That gave us 13, 23. And if you'll recall, H23 gave us 23, 13. So all this is saying is if you have two cosets that are equal, then this element is going to be in the coset, right? So A is in BH, or you could say B is in AH. Those are saying the same thing. And property four and property five really have to do with the same concept. And that concept is that all of the elements of G are partitioned by cosets. So if 13 and I'm sorry, if 1323, if these two cosets are the same, then they have to have an element in common. Whereas for number five, number five is saying AH equals BH. So they're the cosets are the same or they have no elements in common. So again, we know H13 and H23 gave us the same thing. But if I looked at say H1, that was just one and 11. So notice they don't have anything in common. Whereas H13, uh, or I'm sorry, H11 gave us 11 and one. So again, that goes back to what it's saying here. Those two are the same and some other element obviously would give an empty set. So if I used H11 and H23, their intersection would be the empty set because they don't have elements in common. And for our last one, AH equals BH if and only if AB inverse is in H. So again, if I think about AH and BH and I multiply on the left by A inverse, that's going to give me H equals A inverse BH. Therefore, A inverse BH, A inverse B has to be an element of H. And the last three properties, starting with number seven, the order of AH is equal to the order of BH. And that should make sense. The number of elements is going to be the same. Um, and because the number of elements in H is obviously the same. So remember when H was um, 1, 11, all of the cosets were size 2. When H was 0, 3, 6, all of the cosets were size 3. So AH is going to be the same as BH each and every time. For eight, AH equals HA if and only if AHA inverse equals H. So again, you can just do some math here. If we have AH and we multiply it on the right by A inverse equals HA multiplied on the right by A inverse, then we get AHA inverse is equal to H. And then nine, AH is a subgroup of G if and only if A is an element of H. So again, we've talked a little bit before about the fact that not all cosets are subgroups. And in fact, the only time a coset is a subgroup is if A is in the subgroup. 
So if we think about AH, um, we'll use this one, 1 and 11, where H was 1 and 11. Then AH is a subgroup of G. So AH, which was really just 1 and 11 again, is a subgroup of H, which makes perfect sense. Up next, we're going to take a look at Lagrange's theorem and consequences of the theorem.